You're listening to the Pastor Writer Podcast, Episode 29. Before we jump into our interview today, I just wanted to say thanks to those of you who have been joining and also sharing the Christian Writers Book Giveaway that I'm running. I'm giving away 12 books on writing, many of them specifically for the Christian Writer, as well as a $50 Amazon gift card in case there's anything I missed that's on your list. If you haven't already joined, you can do it in the sidebar of this episode or by going to PastorWriter.com and clicking on Giveaway at the top. Hopefully this is something that I can continue doing maybe in the future with other sets of books. I appreciate it if you're participating. Joining me on the podcast today is Tim Challies. Many of you will know him from his blog, Challies.com, where he spent more than 15 years blogging and sharing book reviews from Christian authors. It's a great conversation as we talk about what he's learned from reviewing so many books, over 650 books, as well as how it shaped him being a pastor and a writer of many of his own. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. Thanks for listening. Joining me on the podcast today is Tim Challies, probably a familiar name for many of you. Tim is the author behind Challies.com, one of the largest Christian blogs on the internet. Uh, he oftentimes is known for his reviews of books and has been called by even some of our past guests, one in particular, the grandfather of Christian blogging, which seems like a little bit of an unfair title. I think he's a pretty young guy, so maybe we'll call him the father of Christian blogging. But some people may not realize Tim also serves as a pastor at Grace Fellowship Church in Toronto. He's the co-founder of Cruciform Press and the author of several books of his own, including The Discipline of Spiritual Discernment, Sexual Detox, The Next Story, Life and Faith After the Digital Explosion, and Do More Better. So it's uh, exciting to be able to have you on the podcast today. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Yes, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, maybe a good place to get started is uh, a lot of people are familiar with your blog. They follow maybe the book reviews that you do on there commonly, kind of one of the things you're known for. But maybe you could share a little bit about how you got into blogging and particularly how Chally's.com got started. Sure, yeah. Uh, I got into blogging just sort of by the by, I guess. My family had moved south. I live in Canada. They had moved down to the American South. And uh, I just started to, uh, I started a website, Charlie's.com. It was really meant for my family. So I put pictures of the kids up there and along the way ran into some stuff up here in the church context where I was starting to think things through and I decided to write about it, mostly for the benefit of my family. And uh, they just sort of got picked up by Google or whatever as happens, and other people started reading them. And so I basically just kept going with the the blog, took down the pictures, and uh, kept writing. So yeah, I just sort of got into it by happenstance. I don't think I even really knew the word blogger. It was sort of just being coined around that time. So, um, But yeah, I'm, I'm happy that it worked out the way it did. Well, and what year was that when you very first started with the blog? 2001, I believe. Yeah, so in, in then, internet time, that might make you a grandfather of it, right? That's been yeah. a, a long time to have been online. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I'm convinced the site caught on is that it was just very, very early, right? Today, you can go online, you can find so much content, so many blogs. Back then, there weren't that many bloggers, there weren't that many Christian bloggers. And so as people are thinking about ideas, there's a lot of people working through things like church growth movement and purpose-driven life and the passion of the Christ and reformed theology. There are all these different streams of things people are interested in. They were just starting to learn the habit of going online to look them up. I just happened to be one of the people early on who had that same interest and decided to write about it. So it was uh, just propitious timing in some ways. Well, I'm curious to hear you explain a little bit about when you sensed that writing was more than just something you were stumbling into or doing for family, but when you recognized writing was really a part of your your vocational calling, that your work pastoring and writing were were really something God was leading you into in a bigger way than just something casual on the weekends. So yeah, at the time I started writing, I was um, at a church locally here. I was not on staff. I had no real design to be a pastor or anything like that. So I was in the technical field. I was um, running networks, doing websites, that kind of stuff. And, and so it came along nicely. I was already, or very quickly after I started, self-employed. So I had some extra time or ability to, to work on it during the day. And uh, so those things just kind of went nicely together. Um, but as the blog grew up, I started to realize, like, yeah, it can be a part-time gig. And over time, like, I think it could actually become a full-time gig. And just at the time where I was ready to jump and go in full time is when my church, I started at a new church by then, had been there for several years. They said, would you like to be an elder at the church and then a pastor at the church? So um, I had to sort of step back from the full time thing for a time and was on staff at the church. And then after doing that for about five years, I just realized I've got a church keeps growing up, getting uh, the responsibilities are getting greater. 
and the blog is growing up, the responsibilities are getting greater. And so that was the point where I asked if I could resign the, the pastorate, stay on as an elder, but really focus my attention on writing. Well, I'm curious, um, kind of in both directions, one of the things we look at on the podcast is how these two callings, uh, pastoral ministry and then writing, how they sort of intersect and support each other. Um, how do you think your writing impacted you in the work you were doing as a pastor? And then how do you think having the experience as a pastor has impacted the way that you write and who you are as a writer? Well, writing is how I think. I don't know what I believe. I don't know what I think until I write about it. So uh, writing is for me, it's my meditation. And and to some degree, just lately, I've had some health challenges related to typing. I've got this pretty severe uh, repetitive motion type thing going on in my arm, so I can't type the way I used to. And one of the big realizations coming out of that is I was feeling very spiritually dry. Why was that? Because writing is my meditation. And so I, I take truth and I write it out. That's how I think it through. That's how I drive it down deep inside of me. So I don't think I realized until it was kind of pulled away to some degree what an important discipline it was and how, how it shapes my thinking. Um, so, yeah, I think it was tremendously important um, that way. Uh, actually, uh, I, knowing a little bit from following your blog about some of the physical struggles you've been going through, as one of the areas I was interested in exploring was, uh, yeah. you know, you find yourself full time writing. You're running this ministry online, and then all of a sudden you begin to experience problems. You can sort of explain them in your own words, but the the physical act of typing itself is becoming at times almost unsustainable for you. Um, uh, what does that do to you in your identity as someone who says, I am a writer, this is what I do, this is my ministry, and then all of a sudden you find yourself just challenging day to day to actually physically do it? Um, what was that experience like, and how did you find yourself kind of beginning to trust God and by faith moving beyond the limitation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was sort of a gradual thing because what happened is it's not like one day my arms got just cut off, which in some ways, okay, now I was this, now I am that. Uh, instead, what happened was there was a slow building of pain until one day it was just, you know, I really, I, I came to this realization that this is bad enough. I don't think I can work today at all. And I don't know that I'll be able to work again tomorrow. And um, that sort of opened up that, okay, so what is the future? You know, after a time, if it doesn't get better, what does that look like? And so over the past year or so, it's sort of been up and down days where I can just go ahead and I'm feeling good and top of the world. And Three days later, I'm in severe pain and can't write at all. So I think it's done It's done a number of things. Um, it really has got me wondering about what does it mean to be a writer who can't write? You know, I've defined myself this way, and this is what I love to do. I think this is what the Lord's called me to do. This is where my gifting seems to be. But what do I do if I just can't physically do it? That's been something really difficult to work through. And definitely in terms of identity, it's been a, a challenge as well. Um, almost anything I would want to do in life involves writing. Um, even being a pastor involves, at least in my case, tremendous amounts of writing, whether that's on the administrative side or the sermon prep side. So, uh, yeah, it really set me back a lot. And, you know, lately over the last week or so, it's been a fair bit better. So I've been doing okay and feeling good, but I know by next week I might be uh, completely unable to go again. So it's, uh, I think mentally I've sort of gone back and forth between doing well and then at times being pretty significantly, I don't want to say depressed, but just really down and wondering what it means. And I uh, can't help every now and again, just wondering, is there something the Lord wants me to learn from this? And if I learn that, will it go away and sort of let my mind go down those paths as well? So it's been, uh, it's been interesting. It's been tough. Yeah, well, I think sometimes people, uh, they see success or they see someone with sort of a large platform and they imagine that everything goes so smoothly for you as a writer. And it's been encouraging to hear. I actually, I haven't shared this with very many people on the podcast, but about a year and a half ago, I got diagnosed with a, a tick-borne disease. It's an autoimmune disease yeah. called alpha-galactose. It's actually, believe it or not, this is a real thing. It's called uh, the mammalian meat allergy. So in other words, from this tick bite, you develop anaphylactic reactions to mammal meat and for me, dairy as well. And um, it's wow. created, if I have have cross-contaminated exposures, severe migraines, my throat will swell up, nothing I've ever experienced before. And all this is hitting sort of as I'm working on my last writing project. And I found yeah. myself sort of wrestling through the same questions like, well, how do you be a pastor or a writer if for two days you're sort of locked up in a dark room with migraines? And well, even right. beyond that, how do you be a good father when you don't feel like, you know, you can even open the door from these migraines? And coming to trust that somehow, some way, I wrestled through some of those same questions you're describing of, um, God is doing something in this. And part of what right. this call to write is, is not to just have everything about writing come easily, 
but to be able to bring whatever is broken, whatever is difficult, whatever is really just true of me and find ways to be able to walk through that by faith. And I think this is Paul's point, right? Uh, grace is sufficient. It's enough to just do what God has called me to do. And so um, I've appreciated how open you've been about that process in your own writings through the blog. And as I know it continues to be a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And I think with, with these things, as you would understand, you, you think it's an important part of who you are and therefore you should mention it. On the other hand, and maybe this is just pride. I don't want to be known as the sick guy or I don't want to whine about it. A, because I know there are people out there enduring things that are much, much more serious and, and all that. But I also just don't want to make excuses for myself or, or I don't know what, I just don't want to be that guy. So yeah, it's probably a lot of pride wrapped up in that. But um, so I mention it sparingly, but I do know that people are concerned and uh, want to know about it as well. So, yeah, well, and I think it's a helpful reminder that uh, there there is no ideal writing life, correct? Like you sort no. of you you are what you are. You're a human with all the same flaws, and you you write because you find a way to do it, however you can do it, because it's in you to do. And I think for a lot of listeners who are struggling for a whole sort of reasons. Uh, some physical, some not at all, some just emotional, some spiritual, to really practice this thing they've been called to. I think it's a good reminder that we bring who we are and what we have with us. It's never something sure. perfect. We just do the work God has called us to. Right. And we all have our ideal writing life that we've mapped out, and maybe for weeks or even months at a time we get to live it. And it's amazing when everything works out well. You're in your routine, and you're getting up when you want to get up, and you're sleeping well, and you've got that creative spark, and you can just go. Um, but so much of life in any vocation is lived in um, distraction and mess and chaos and trying to make the most of rough situations and so on. So writing is no different. You know, most of the time we're, we're not at our peak. And uh, one of the things I look forward to in, in eternity is what would it mean to, to have a truly clear, sharp mind? I don't think we ever experience that on earth. There's always some background illness or suffering or pain or distraction or something. So uh, looking forward to, to learning what that would actually look like. Yeah, I think uh, C.S. Lewis in one of his writings says uh, there's some people's personalities that will surprise us when we get to heaven because we didn't realize how much of who they were was sort of worn down by the limitations of this body or our own right. mental abilities or sicknesses. But when those things are off, you know, who, know, who knows who will truly be and what it'll be to have a sharp mind to be able to just right. take in everything that God is doing around us. Right. Yeah, it sounds amazing. Uh, well, I was doing a little digging on your blog, trying to come up with a number for about how many book reviews you have done. Uh, so my, my, I, I think it's safe to say over 15 years you've been reviewing books and, uh, just sort of by counting the pagination on, on the book review section of your site, I came up with something around 680 book reviews that are posted. Do you have any sense of how many book reviews you've published on the site? No, not at all. I really don't follow statistics for my site, so I don't really have I don't count those things. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That yeah, sounds it's a significant right. number. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm curious. That's uh, it's number one. It's obviously a lot of books to review, but what it reflects is a lot of reading that you've done and the seriousness mm -hmm. which you give to reading. Um, what is the role of reading for the writer and how is reading like that over the last 15 years impacted the way you've written for the blog, but really your own books as well? So I think I, I well, first I used to do a lot more reading than I do now, at least toward reviews um, in a, and I think partly that was a pre YouTube world and pre Netflix world. So it was maybe a little easier to read back then. Um, but yeah, I was reading probably two books a week at one point and then sort of whittled it down to one book a week. And now I think it's probably even less than that though. I am doing a lot of reading now directed toward projects and uh, other things so that I'm not actually reviewing those books. Um, but reading is what fuels the writer, and I can't tell you how many times I've just felt dry as a writer, and I just have nothing to say, and my wife will just say, go read a book, you idiot. Like, you know <laughs> you need to be reading. You need to keep filling your mind. You need to keep finding ideas, and when you find ideas, they, they spark other ideas. So um, writers absolutely need to read and read consistently and read um, just vast amounts of material. Um, A, so we have uh, examples to imitate. You know, you want to read good writers and you want them to help you become a better writer. Um, but also just so you're living in the realm of ideas, just constantly bringing ideas into your life so you can uh, turn those ideas around. You can think about them. You can write about them. You can analyze them. Uh, they, they really do fuel us in, in every way. 
Well, one of the benefits, I think, of following your review work and the books uh, on your on your site is that it really helps figure out what to read, which is a challenge. There's so much being published today. There's so many publishers putting out even good books that mm-hmm. trying to make decisions about what to read next and uh, what's important to stay caught up with can be a challenge. I'm curious how how you plan out your reading and then also as a part of that, how you store, or how you come up with the ideas you're going to write about, because often you're publishing multiple times, uh, sometimes a day, a week through the, through the blog. So how do you, mm-hmm. how do you plan out reading? How do you plan out writing? So again, reading, I haven't planned out much. So at my best a couple of years ago, I was just looking at what is coming out. I was keeping tabs on what's new and what might be interesting and then trying to figure out what are the best of the books and what are the worst of the popular books. And I'll review those. So um, when heaven tourism genre was in full swing, I was really trying to keep closely tuned to that. And as new books come out, like let's take a look at them and let's analyze them. Uh, A lot of what I've tried to do all along is to serve as a resource for pastors. Pastors get asked all the time, what book should I read? What's a good book on this subject? And I know that many don't have the time or inclination or ability to read the books. Um, Plus, they all just show up at my door. So I thought if I can do a lot of that reading and put out reviews, these are simple reviews. They're, you know, I'm not an academic. I'm not reading on an academic level. These are general level reviews by a general level writer. Um, Just try and serve the church by getting that stuff out there and especially serve pastors. Um, so yeah, I, I planned those out again this year, especially I've got this project going on. That's got me majorly distracted from my other reading. And, um, so I've been focusing a lot on church history, but not reviewing those books because honestly, most people aren't that interested in it. Um, in terms of planning out the blog, I use Trello, which is a great little app, uh, set it up as an editorial calendar and I just keep throwing ideas into there. And then sort of it's one, it's, a. uh, you, The way you you use Trello is to move things from the left to the right across boards as you develop the ideas. And so I throw the ideas in and over time develop them out until I can uh, have a fully formed idea. As you think about some of the work you've done reading and then also engaging with just sort of what's happening across Christianity, sort of the themes right now, um, what are some of the things that encourage you? about Christian writing, um, the work you see happening across publishers, the books that are being published, uh, things that you see are just positives or, or things you'd like to continue to see grow and build that have been happening over the last few years? Well, there's just so much writing going on, and that's encouraging. There's a lot of people doing a lot of writing and a lot of good writing. I, I don't know that we're doing a lot of original writing right now. I think most of it is deriv- derivative, and I don't exclude myself from that. Uh, so I'd like to see maybe a a little bit more originality and b just a little more quality. Um, there's so many people eager to buy books that the bar isn't very high. And um, with social media in its infancy, but such an important part, uh, we're willing to hand out book contracts to people who will be um, popular, even if they aren't particularly good. Maybe that's always been the case as well. So um, you know, I think the the Christian market could use uh, a quality overhaul in some ways. Um, but oh, I'm very encouraged by people wanting to write and covering lots of topics, covering a massive variety of topics. And really, I don't think there's too many topics where we can't say we've got at least one really solid book and often two or three really solid books on the subject. Yeah, it's always a question that I hear people pose is, um, do because it's at the heart of what you're describing here. Do we need more writers or less writers? Uh, mm-hmm. So it's interesting to sort of wrestle through that because you're right. We're probably publishing more than we ever have before right now. Um, I think so. Probably the access, even if you just take how much writing is being done online, it feels that way. It feels like there's a lot of really good small presses that are coming up, and it's more achievable for people to publish today than in many ways before. But you're right. Because of that, it seems like, so much is getting published off of platform or getting published off of the existing audiences um, that not only does it make it hard to know what to read or to find, um, but you're right. Like the, the market seems to sort of incentivize speed, um, being prolific. The more, the faster you can get it to market, the better. Uh, so it is an interesting sort of benefit and also sort of a, a warning or in some ways a negative that we're in right now. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And, you know, the the main benefit in a book is the person who writes it, right? It, the, all the effort that goes into it, all the time, all the study, it benefits the author. So, hey, if somebody writes a book and it only sells a few hundred copies, but that person got a lot of benefit, then great. You know, that's that's not a wasted project. Uh, I think a lot of what, what we as the reader need to think about is just 
A, how many books do I need to read on this subject? And um, B, am I giving too much priority to modern books when there may be something better that was written a long time ago? And we certainly have some of that chronological snobbery that many people have written about uh, today where we, we do give a lot of preference to newer books rather than older ones. And maybe to people we like um, as well, give a little too much preference to their books rather than somebody who may say it better in a way that challenges us in a deeper way. Yeah, you've sort of already alluded to it a little bit, but one of the sort of big themes that people discover pretty quickly once you get into writing, particularly publishing, is this idea of platform. Uh, Publishers are looking for authors to have platform. People are trying to grow platform. Um, I think it's safe to say that through the site, and even as you've put it, just through time, the work you've put in, um, challenge.com has a a pretty good audience behind it, a a large platform a lot of people would strive for, try to build towards. I'm interested Mm -hmm. to hear you talk about maybe some of the things people don't realize about what goes into managing an audience that size, or maybe some of the things that make writing difficult because of having an audience that size, just maybe behind the scenes, everybody's after a bigger audience, everybody wants a bigger platform. What do you see as some of the the things that maybe people overlook or don't think about when they just blindly start pursuing that audience, that platform? Sure. And I want to be careful that I'm not complaining about it because as you said, many people strive for it and it is a great blessing. Um, But what people might not understand is that you definitely hit a point where Anything you say will make somebody angry. And so basically any topic you write about, somebody's going to send you an angry email. Somebody's going to go off on you on social media. And um, that, that, that is a burden after a time. Um, and not just a burden for you. Your, your kids or your spouse may see that stuff as well. And it just becomes part of the background of, uh, of the whole thing. And then also as, as the site grows up like that, so too does the administrative overhead. Um, So there's a lot of administration that goes into keeping a site like mine going, which essentially means people need to be hired to do some of that because otherwise you're now spending all your time being an administrator instead of being a creator. The very same thing pastors run into, right? If a pastor isn't careful to guard his study time and his people time, soon it'll get run over by just the cares of running this organization that is a church. So uh, very similar to that. I've had to Uh, get some people around me who can take care of that stuff so I can bring what I think is the best value, which is just to be creative. Well, it's one of the subjects we explore on the podcast a lot because um, it, it seems like there's so many ways to stumble in the process. Um, you're, you know, you are writing out of an act of calling and ministry and trying to contribute. And as an audience begins to form around that, um, it can quickly sort of uh, overwhelm you and it can start tempting you in new ways. And you can start writing for the fame or writing for the success of it. And um, I'm curious, as, as you see, and I'm sure you see this a lot as you're interacting with new authors or new books, as you see authors that are working to build platform, to build an audience, what are some warnings you have about guarding their soul, watching for temptations, really trying to do it in an honest, uh, sort of reverent and faithful way before the Lord? Warnings you have about building a platform? Sure. Um, I'd say one thing would be, uh, this is this is hard to, to explain, but write for yourself, not for other people. And what I mean is, if there's no benefit to you in the article, then I think you're just being pandering to other people. And so there's vast amounts of material that are being written out there that really doesn't do anybody any good. You yourself would read it, right? You just created it because you know it will gain, it'll gain clicks. Um, so, you know, you got to be so careful of that BuzzFeed kind of approach, you know, of a great headline and a great graphic, but nothing behind it. As Christians, especially, we're eager to serve people, right? We're, we're eager to do what's truly good and beneficial for them. And I know that wasting their time with a big headline and a great graphic, but nothing behind it, that's, that's not serving them. So, um, so I think be very, very careful with that to make sure you're backing those things up um, and asking yourself, would I actually read this? Is there some benefit to me in this? If there isn't, then, then what are you actually doing? What's, what's actually the point of it? Um, so I think a lot of people go wrong in those ways. There's, there's so much material out there that's just empty. And you, know, you can go to any site about blogging and find how to create a great headline and your five easy ways to or nine things you won't believe about all of that stuff. I think in general, there might be a place for that every now and again. But in general, just write good material. Um, another thing would be don't, don't condescend too much to the blogging medium. Which is to say, you know, you're supposed to write, according to the experts, no more than 250 words or 500 words or whatever and have lots of subheadings and italics and 
uh, very short paragraphs and all that kind of stuff. But I just think what you win them with is what you win them to. You know, if you treat people like adults and write good content, then expect people that over that over time people will come to your site and learn to actually appreciate that. We've seen lots of churches who have preached their sermonettes for Christianettes and then marveled later on that their people aren't growing, that they're not growing strong in the Lord. Whereas churches that are just giving people the meat of the word. I think over time, see, not only do they draw more people, but their people are really, they become um, strong people. And I think as bloggers, we can do the same. You know, we don't have to condescend too much to what people think they want or what we're told people want, but give people something really substantial, something that'll be beneficial to them. Yeah, I think there's this big sort of tightrope, this tension you walk where you say, you start off with something to say, something valuable to say, and then you're sort of told initially, well, before you can say anything, you need to build an audience and have a platform and a readership and an email list, and th- then you'll be able to sort of put that thing out there you want to say. And so you go about this work sort of building the platform, and then you start picking up all the ways that people build platform and build email lists. And by the end, you've yeah. sort of built an audience that doesn't really hear what you had to say to begin with. And I'm not sure you really have anything left to say because so much of it's just become what everyone else is saying, what everyone else is doing. And um, you right. know, if I could, part, part of what impresses me about the work you've done on Chalice.com is you really have years and years and years of just daily showing up and putting in the work behind you. Um, there's mm-hmm. a kind of perseverance and a kind of patience and, and a, a sort of lack of desperation, just a willingness to be faithful <laughs> to it that I think is, is really worth people paying attention to. How do you cultivate that in your soul? The sort of patience and diligence that just continues to show up and do the right work and sort of trust that over time God God will do what he'll do with it. I mean, that's what we're doing at the local church level, right? Is we're doing, we get what, an hour and a half a week in public services. If you got an evening service, you get maybe three hours a week. And you're trusting that if we just keep doing these simple things the Lord calls us to, then over time, we will see people growing in the Lord. Um, There's always this temptation to start this program or to jump on this new exciting thing that's going to bring great, huge, immediate results. But that's just not life. I mean, you think about marriage, you think about parenting. So much of life just takes time and patience. And so I think I've learned that elsewhere in life and then just applied that to the blog. I also really took my eye off of statistics. There's a time when I was really obsessed and constantly comparing Uh, But instead, I just said, I'm not going to worry about the numbers. I'm just going to do what I think is helpful for people. I'm going to create good content or what I think is good content and what I think will be helpful to people. And I'll just keep putting it out and I'll just trust that the numbers will come. So it might be once a year now I open up Google Analytics and actually take a look at at who's been visiting the site and that kind of stuff. Um, But I do that, you know, I do that deliberately because I just know how quickly my heart can can want to do things for the numbers. It, it's such a, a quick shift from creating content that's good to creating content that will get people. And, you know, I know there's things I could do on my site where within a month I would be able to massively increase my traffic. There are tricks I could do and they would really, really work. But I think I would be doing those to some degree at the expense of my my own soul and at the expense of um, the, the benefit of the people who, who are visiting my site. So, uh, I think a slow approach is very, very good. Just give people good content. Yeah, it's helpful. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that perspective because you go online and you start digging into, okay, how do I start building a platform and audience? And pretty much immediately you're met with all the tips, all the tricks, all the sort of inroads to sort of build it fast, do it quicker, do it uh, cheaper. And so to hear you say that, look, it's not something I give that much attention to. I do my best to stay out of it and just be faithful to the work is I think a reminder, uh, we don't need to be checking Google Analytics every single day, <laughs> every single post that we put up, right. that really the work is what matters first and foremost and faithfulness to it. Yeah, and how do you measure that, right? So a number, it, it's just like in the, in the local church level, you know, we had like a church growth movement telling us numbers matter so much. Look at the numbers and trace your growth and all that. But they had to come back later and admit there is no relationship between the number of people in the church on Sunday and actually discipling people. There's none whatsoever. So we've done this whole movement and it really has not delivered the most important thing, which is disciple making. Uh, and I think within the within blogs, it can be very, very much the same. You can get the people. That doesn't mean you're doing anything to benefit them. So 
How will you know if your blog is effective? Well, if that article, if you labor on an article for three hours and very few people read it, but it makes a significant impact on one person, you've got to rejoice at that. That's a, that's a great thing. Just like if you preach a sermon, what, what's the likelihood you're ever going to preach a sermon and see mass conversions? But if one person grows closer to the Lord, one person comes to faith through a sermon, I mean, praise God, right? What more could you want than that? So uh, it's okay to measure small and to measure in very non-quantitative ways, you know, just what am I doing that benefits other people? How can I serve them? How can I help them grow closer to the Lord? Yeah, I do think, um, as I think about my own preaching, pastors have an opportunity here to sort of recognize that connection with writing. Um, one of the things I tried to do with preaching was to stop uh, stop paying as much attention to how good was that particular sermon and start mm-hmm. paying more attention to what did, what, what developed over a year of sermons? You know, where am I from four, th- five years ago to where I am today? And taking that same approach with writing to say, I'm just going to continue to be faithful to it and then be able to look over larger periods of time or not necessarily single blog posts, but what is God doing through it and using continually faithfully into that? Um, I think it's a good reminder. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there, there's so much in life we'd like to easily measure. And it's part of our lives now in this modern world is everything can be quantified. We've got numbers for everything. You know, everywhere we go, there are metrics. Uh, but there are some things that are far more important than that and just can't be quantified. I, I, I think we need to really resist that trap of making everything numbers and, and gauging our success and setting our moods and all of that accordingly. Yeah, and you started at the beginning uh, when you answered that question. Um, you mentioned sort of you know your own heart well enough, and I think one of the big keys is to know where you are, to know how looking at the numbers impacts you, to know to know where you tend to stumble and fall towards this pride. Because um, you know you think back through biblical characters, and there's some that preach for decades and see nothing come of it, and there are others who in their first sermon see thousands converted, and um, you sort of begin to recognize you can't fall into one or the other camp. It's not a sort of, you know, I will not care about any number, I will not ever look, which tends to be the debate, right? Or er, all that matters is the numbers, the pragmatics of them. But sort of the ability to hold that tension and say, at the end of the day, what matters most is not one side or the other, but to know my own heart, to know my own tendencies, to know what one action versus the other does to me and does to my faith. And to be able to sort mm-hmm. of navigate that personally is a really important skill set that I think hopefully we're mastering. God help us before he does give us a large audience or does right. give us that temptation, that responsibility. Yeah. And to maintain a clear conscience before the Lord, right? The end of it all, to be able to say, I've done what I believe honors and serves you and you take these poor efforts and use them for your glory. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, um, let me ask this. Uh, as you think about your development as a writer, are there certain authors, so maybe some of them are Christian authors, or maybe some of them are just uh, writers on writing, but books or voices that have impacted you and helped shape who you are as a writer? Yeah, probably. I don't ever have one person I can point to, or even just a couple of people I can point to. Um, you know, I, I, I love Malcolm Gladwell. I, I, I've read all his books and would love to be able to write like that. So in some ways, I think he's somebody I aspire to, his his ability with the pen, his ability to just take complex ideas and make them simple. Um, but no, I don't, I don't have certain people I, I, I really come back to. I, and I've read very few books on writing. Now and again, I have, but Mostly, I've just tried to read other good books and to grow through the craft. So one of my concerns with writers is that we are amazing procrastinators. We can always find a reason not to write. And one of the best reasons we find not to write is to read about writing. Um, But at the end of the day, you're only ever going to become a better writer by writing. Books can help. Courses can help all that. At the end of the day, you got to put your fingers on the keyboard and, and just go for it. So... Um, I really think that's that's what I've focused on is just writing, 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 and hoping along the way I develop better skill. Yeah, I sort of chuckled. Uh, there's there's so many courses online about writing that you could literally mm-hmm. just spend every day learning to be a writer and never actually just sit down and actually write. So right, yeah, right. I do and think more, it's more a huge temptation. And, yeah, yeah, lots of great tools. I mean, I love some of the tools that are available. Um, there, there's some great stuff out there, but the end of the day, <laughs> there's there's nothing like just plain doing it. So um, that's where we have to put the, the bulk of our effort. And I just know my own temptation toward procrastination. And it can feel really, really good to, to think about writing or talk about writing or 
or tweet about writing, but at the end of the day, I got to open up my, my app and I got to get going. Yeah. Yeah. And don't even need the right app, right? Like at the end of the day, a, a pad of paper and a pen, if that's yeah. what it takes, just something in front of me. Right. Yeah, yep. exactly. Though I tell you, I am really thrilled with the writing apps we have available to us today. And I've seen development in this area from when I began till now and uh, would not want to go back. So there's, we've got some amazing tools that really do in their own way help us. They do foster writing. Uh, they serve us well in that way. So I, I want people to take good advantage of those tools. Yeah. Yeah, not to invalidate our last point, but uh, I've seen online yeah. you you typically write in Ulysses. Is that still true? That's still true, yep. Yeah, that's actually my favorite as well. So that's the same one that I use. And yeah, I found it to be a phenomenal yeah. tool. So especially if you have if you have any experience, it's not hard, I don't think, to get behind the sort of markdown language for writing. But I find it to be really, really helpful just to get everything else out of the way but the words. Yep, exactly. An empty screen with a cursor and nothing else to distract you. And, and that's especially important when there's so much we do through our computers. If you're writing with a notebook, you're good. You know, that notebook is never going to buzz or, or by, by a notebook, I mean a paper notebook. You're never going to have notifications flashing on it, any of that. But if you're writing on a phone, an iPad, a computer, these are extremely multifunctional devices. So all you can do to turn that stuff off and go full screen and avoid all the other windows uh, I don't know how many good ideas, and I'm sure you can relate to this, you've had great ideas, you've been in the in the moment, you're right in that state of flow, they call it, that we all love, and then boom, you get interrupted by some notification, and it just, it knocks you out, it sets you back. So um, we've got to learn that discipline of shutting other things down so we can focus on the words. Yeah, well, let's, uh, maybe a good way to sort of wrap up is this too. Um, as you think about a lot of people listening to the podcast are sort of in the place we've been describing. They, they're sensing a call to write. Maybe they're practicing it. They're doing it. They're trying to get more disciplined about it. Um, what is some advice you would give to people who are wanting to improve as a writer, are wanting to take their writing more seriously, and maybe do have some aspirations to someday publish advice you have for young writers or beginning writers? So first, just write. Uh, again, there's so many reasons not to, and none of us are as good a writer as we want to be. All of us are very self-conscious about our words, very embarrassed by our words, all of that. Uh, you just got to get over it, um, and you just got to write. So so write, write, and write some more. That's, that's really the path to growth. The second is find someone who will read your writing. And, you know, I developed a writing group at our church. I had a bunch of people get together once a week, and we would just read our stuff out loud to one another. It was it was tough at the beginning. It was awkward at the beginning, but I think it was really beneficial for us to learn to evaluate one another's reading um, or one another's writing. Have some friends who are willing to read it, especially if you're uncertain about it, you know, if it's edgy or if it's critiquing something or, um, you know, if you're not totally sure of your theology, bounce it off some people. And then search out and use really good tools. I think people can grow frustrated because they're using poor tools. Um, but if you... This, this is one of the areas where um, I, I think we don't allow ourselves to take advantage of good tools because for some reason we don't want to spend five ninety nine on an app or something. But if writing is important to you, put some good money, invest some effort or invest some funds into getting a, a really good app, buy a really good font if you need to, and, and make an environment that's very conducive to creativity and to writing. And I think you can find even right there it will make a really significant difference to you. Yeah, I always add, uh, I remind myself, nobody reads what I write. They usually read what I revise. So if I can get myself past the insecurity of just sitting down and writing and recognizing, mm -hmm. I don't have to show this to anyone. I don't have to hit publish the moment that right. I'm done, right? The act of writing is not something that exposes me. So let's stop for a second. And it's just me, right? It's just me and these words right. in front of me. Then, but okay. maybe we can begin to break down some of that insecurity that forms and blocks us. Yeah, one of the things I've had to do lately because of my inability to type at times is I've had some of the ladies from the church come over and type for me. Um, and that was that mm. was hard Yeah. Um, because not only is that a completely different form of communication, but there is a certain intimacy in writing where it's it, there, there's this relationship that exists between me and my screen and I'm pouring out my heart onto the screen. And now suddenly I'm sitting in a chair over here and this friend from church is sitting at my desk and I'm talking to her and she's typing words on the screen. And so I found that very difficult. It, it became easier over time, but it did show me 
some of the relationship I have to my words and to my word processor. And it was strange letting somebody else into that very early stage of writing rather than, hey, here's a pretty well-developed draft for you to read. So I think it was healthy in the end, uh, but interesting as well. Yeah. Well, uh, let me sort of wrap up by just saying thanks. I know I speak for many, uh, several of the guys in my church that have just particularly found some of the work that you do on pornography and struggles has just been really valuable to them. They were excited I was getting a chance to talk with you. And I know for myself, okay. I, I love the reviews you do on books. And so for so many who enjoy following the blog, uh, I know it's a lot of work, but we appreciate it and the ministry that it is. And what are ways that maybe people who are just hearing you for the first time or haven't come across your work, ways that they can keep up with what you're doing, um, um, read the work you're putting out, but also the books, plans you have in the future as well. Yeah, I think if you just uh, go to chalies.com now and again or subscribe to Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, well, slash chalies. Um, I think if you stay in any of those channels, you'll uh, see the highlights of some of what I'm doing. And um, generally this this time, uh, around this time, I'm publishing a few articles a week and a couple of videos a week and intend to stay on that that balance for the time being. Uh, some of the videos are just me working out an idea. Some of the travel videos as I've been going around the world this year. And then uh, we're working towards a new book and video projects in the future. So a uh, lot's coming up. Well, we'll be following it and uh, I'll make sure I uh, get links shared for people to be able to. And just want to say thanks again for your candor, the work you do and being on the podcast with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for it. As always, you can find show notes for today as well as links to Tim's blog and his books by going to pastorwriter.com slash 29. Also, if you haven't already, I would really appreciate you leaving a review, particularly on iTunes. It's easy. You can just leave a star review or take the time to write out a review, but it's a great way to help other people find the podcast as well as for me to be able to get feedback about the show. As always, thanks for listening. Until next time.